this particular lecture is going to be about blockchain security and what exactly it means when we say blockchain security and why we even care about blockchain security. So start off, I'm Nadir. I graduated from UC Berkeley in December 2019 in computer science and I'm currently a blockchain security intern and soon to be engineer at Coinbase. Now hopefully you've all heard of Coinbase at this point. It is to my knowledge the largest exchange in the world. Oh, yeah, feel free to raise your hand. Um, and I also want to preface this by saying that any opinions I put out there are not Coinbase's, they are only my own. So any other legal implications, yeah, you know. So I was formerly a research engineer at Quantstamp where I was doing smart contract security. I also contributed to a book on smart contract security there and have been doing smart contract security for about a year and a half. And out Coinbase, I'm doing general blockchain security. So my take is not going to be so much, here are the specific types of vulnerabilities, and here's what you can do to prevent each and every single one. Because quite frankly, that's just a list that you can read and memorize. It doesn't really teach you how to think about blockchain security. So my goal is to give you sort of the uh, high level overview of what security looks like. I was the former president of Blockchain in Berkeley, along with the head of education, head of internal, and I've also led a security consulting project for CRED, one of our clients from last semester via Blockchain in Berkeley, in which we were evaluating the security of their code base and their integrations with uh, the Ethereum blockchain. I also co-taught the Blockchain's Fundamental Decal back in fall 2017. I had some of the largest turnouts out of any class in the world, and now edX, the course that it's built off of has about 120,000 students around the world. And I also developed a set of notes along with one of my friends, Rusty, that accompanied the course, which was the groundwork for a book around cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And I've taught all over the place. I've taught in San Diego, uh, at Qualcomm for C-suite executives, Taiwan, UC Berkeley School of Information. I've taught a lot of different kinds of people and a lot of different topics. So if you have any questions, I highly encourage you to ask. I love answering questions. And if you ask me a question I've never heard before, I will be thoroughly impressed. And I'm sure if you have a question, everyone else has it too. One thing I'll note is that I am notorious for being a little bit too enthusiastic and going too quickly sometimes. So if you need me to slow down, just point it out and I'll do my best to fix my pacing. Oh, enough about me. Let's talk about what this lecture is actually going to be about. So first, we're going to answer the question of what blockchain security is and why it matters. And then we're going to go into what I like to think of as the three different layers to blockchains and blockchain security. The first one being the blockchain itself, the base protocol that we rely on in order to do things. The second one being the application, something that is built on top of the blockchain protocol. And the third one being the integration, the way in which we build off-chain services that integrate with blockchains and the applications built on top of them. So to start off, what is blockchain security? Well, in order to understand what blockchain security is, let's first define what a blockchain is and what security is. So a blockchain in itself, it's really just a linked list with hash pointers. It's, however, the, the relevant thing about a blockchain is that we use it in distributed and adverse adversarial contexts. In other words, we use it with peers we don't know and with peers we don't trust and with other peers who we don't control even. And so in these contexts, we want to create and maintain a ledger of transactions. And security, to put it simply, refers to resistance to attackers. You want to prevent bad things from happening. That's what security means, whether it's security by a lock you install on your front door or a password you use to keep your email safe. These are all ways to protect yourself against unwanted behavior. So blockchain security, stitching the two together, is ensuring that a distributed ledger and the supported applications correctly perform their jobs in the presence of adversaries or attackers. So why is blockchain security so tricky? Now what makes blockchain security so tricky is the amount of complexity that is involved with a blockchain. I'm sure you've been learning a lot about blockchain thus far and you must have seen all the different things you have to consider when you're working with different kinds of blockchains or just different kinds of distributed ledgers. So blockchains, in order to function correctly, they require monetary policies, cryptography, consensus protocols, 
block propagation and networking procedures, programming languages, and possibly more. The point is that these not only have a lot of components, but they're also completely different fields that all need to come together. And to properly do blockchain security, you need to be able to understand at least some of them and, you know, best case, all of them, but you also need to be able to recognize where your shortcomings are and be able to point out where you might need more help. So you have people with completely different experiences working together on one single solution when it comes to blockchain, which makes it so very unique. And it's because a lot of people don't have that experience that they end up building products that don't work. And especially it's the nascency or the like the short amount of time that blockchain has been around that causes it to be so dangerous because people, they want to build stuff. They think blockchain is cool. It's distributed tech. It's trustless. It's never been done before, right? So they end up doing stuff, moving fast, breaking things, but they don't really consider how that plays with the permanence of blockchain. Like the point of blockchain is to be immutable and you can consider it the same way that you think about hardware or about I, I like to say mission critical infrastructure, whether it's building infrastructure for a spaceship or for a plane or for nuclear weapons, right? all of this stuff is stuff that you can't just fix if it goes wrong. It'll have devastating consequences that you cannot take back. And the same thing applies with blockchain. If something goes wrong, there is no undo button. There is no control Z or command Z. There's only whatever you might have built into the, to the protocol in order for that to happen. But the proposition that blockchain offers is the immutability. So most often people are doing things, not realizing what the consequences will be, and then getting burned in the process along with millions of dollars in the process. So that is what blockchain security is. Are there any questions thus far about what we mean when we say blockchain security and why it matters? Cool. All right. Well, again, feel free to ask if you have any questions. So we'll talk about the first layer, the blockchain. So here, this is sort of what I imagine as the, a very simple way in which we think about the, the entire stack. Like we have fundamentally networking. This is the ability to send information from one person to another, right? I can send information to someone else via Facebook Messenger or via Zoom, and that person will, will receive it. And that is the base networking layer that we have that we trust works correctly. On top of this networking layer, we've built a blockchain, which could be Bitcoin, Ethereum, any fundamental protocol that enables distributed and trustless consensus. So the blockchain refers to that particular portion of the thing we're talking about. And that's what we're gonna focus in on in this section. So in order to understand how we can even secure the blockchain in the first place, we need some concept of success, what our blockchain aims to achieve. Because the whole point of security is to make it difficult for attackers to make things happen incorrectly. So if we want to protect against the incorrect stuff, we have to understand what is it that we actually want to do? That's the first question that needs to be answered. And then from there, we can ask about some principles that we must adhere to in order to achieve that idea of success. Do we favor safety or liveness? Safety being the guarantee that nothing bad will ever happen, or liveness being the guarantee that something good may eventually happen. So a way you can see this is like safety is never going outside, which is kind of pertinent now, nowadays, but um, safety is like never going outside. You don't talk to anyone, you don't do anything that could possibly be risky, but you also don't get the opportunity to do anything. So safety would be never going outside. Liveness would be you're always out and about doing things that you enjoy, uh, but you're not really considering the risks, right? So you need a balance of those two in order to ensure something that's meaningful. Because if you don't have one or the other, you're going to end up having like some kind of loss of quality. And so you also wanna ask, do you prefer simplicity and safety, or do you accept the risks that come with feature rich complexity? So Bitcoin, for example, is simple and tries to be safe. It doesn't want to upgrade in ways that are not necessary. And it doesn't want to you know, change things that have been proven and tested. It wants to ensure that it can move money from point A to point B, no questions asked. Ethereum, on the other hand, is much more comfortable with doing things that no one else has ever done before. Hence ETH 2.0, the scaling and sharding and all of these different propositions. 
those are all in order to enhance the blockchain. But with all of those features comes risks of things that do not work correctly. With complexity, there's always another place where there might be a bug that will lead to a vulnerability, that will lead to an exploit, that will lead to money lost. And then finally, after you've chosen what principles you want to adhere to, you come to a consensus protocol that you want to rely on in order to ensure that your different machines or different entities come to agreement on something meaningful, like proof of work, proof of stake, practical Byzantine fault tolerance, um, proof of authority, so to say, where someone just says, here's the truth, um, different amounts of centralization and trustlessness and scalability. And you always, almost always need an incentive scheme when dealing with untrusted peers. I can't imagine a scheme where you have untrusted peers and no incentive schemes. The incentive schemes are there to ensure that people who don't have a reason to be honest now have a reason. Like with Bitcoin, the block reward is given to those who help to secure the network. If you're trying to attack the network, you won't get your block rewards because the honest majority will take it instead and stuff like that. And with Tendermint, for example, the Cosmos, the sort of base algorithm that's used for Cosmos consensus, that's implementing slashing, where if you do something wrong, you get your funds taken away. So stuff like that needs to be considered. And that consensus protocol will usually exemplify the principles and the concept of success that you're looking for. Are there any questions so far? Cool. So here's some examples of success. Some goals that people have aimed for when creating blockchains were creating a decentralized currency, enabling decentralized trustless computation, tracking identities and voting, putting computational power towards research or even something else. And each of these different definitions of success comes with some trade-offs. When you want decentralized trustless computation, you're able to allow anything to happen on the platform. And that's scary because now anyone can do anything and it's all public. So how do you ensure that anything that's not supposed to happen doesn't happen? Right. You're giving up the ability to ensure that no one can do things that are wrong in order to allow people to do things that might be even greater than what you could do when you were restricted. So there's all these different questions that need to be made in order to achieve those de definitions of success, whether it's prioritizing safety or liveness, as I mentioned before, security or complexity. Supplier demand is an interesting one as well. Do you want to have a finite supply to ensure that everyone knows how much money there is in the system? as Bitcoin does with its 21 million Bitcoin supply cap? Or do you meet demand and allow everyone to be able to get some amount of this token as Ethereum does, where the supply is not capped, it'll continue growing unless they were to change that. And finally, do you want it to be trustless or limited? Do you want the protocol to be governed by the resources on chain or do you want it to be limited to some trusted known of peers, or do you want some combination? You have to make trade-offs in each of these situations. And one will get you perhaps more functionality at the cost of possible security risks. So all of these questions need to be made, or need to be answered. And then finally, when we're talking about the consensus algorithm, we want to know how to build our system. Do we want it to be synchronous where every peer needs to be online in order to communicate? or asynchronous, where peers can be online and offline, and as long as they follow the consensus protocols otherwise, they're still able to participate. Do you want finality or mutability? Do you want your blockchain every single time a block is produced to agree on that block? Or do you want the way that Bitcoin does it for different forks to exist for some time, for one fork to eventually be the leader? In the short term, you might have a difference of opinion, but in the long term, you can rely on everyone eventually coming to an agreement on the longest chain. Do you want Nakamoto style or BFT style consensus? Do you want it to be resource governed or do you want it to be voting governed? And do you want specialized or generic resources? Do you want ASICs or do you want GPUs? All right, Bitcoin has ASICs and says that specialized hardware is healthy for the network to make people buy into the network specifically. But Ethereum says, no, everyone should be able to participate we encourage the use of GPUs and discourage the use of ASICs with our specialized hashing al algorithm. So there's all these trade-offs that need to be made and all of them are going to affect however you view the security of the network. So are there any questions so far about 
any of these decisions or why these decisions need to be made. You're both free to type and to say it out loud if you'd like. Well, the main takeaway there being that you always want to make sure that whatever trade-offs you're making, you understand the risks that come with those trade-offs. So one example actually of a blockchain level bug that demonstrates how not even Bitcoin is totally, at least back then, secure, is when there was an overflow bug. Now, for those of you who may not know, an overflow is when an integer of some size, like UN32, exceeds the total amount that it can hold. So if UN32 or UN64, meaning a, a number with a, an unsigned integer with 32 bits or 64 bits respectively, if you add a one to that max value, it'll loop all the way back around to zero. So what someone was able to do was create a transaction such that the value out was some extremely large number. But if you summed all those values back up together, it would produce some very small number equaling the input. And so this of course is not supposed to happen. You don't want people printing money out of thin air, but it was possible because of the lack of checks around whether or not there was any overflow when summing up the output. So the solution for this was to have two checks. The first one being make sure that there's no overflow when doing the addition. And the second one being make sure that you don't produce more than 21 million Bitcoin in a single transaction. Because if you do, it doesn't matter what math got you there, it shouldn't be valid because you have this supply cap, this physical limit that you cannot exceed even if you had every single last Bitcoin in the world. So the reason they had both of these is for complete mediation. Even if the overflow check failed, at least you have another check to ensure that something crazy isn't happening. Cool. And then the second vulnerability also from Bitcoin was transaction malleability. Transaction malleability is a very strange vulnerability in that it doesn't really make sense unless you get what's going on. So with every transaction, we have ECDSA, elliptic curve digital signature algorithms that are used to produce signatures via a private key for a given transaction. And that signature will say, hey, I attest that the person with this private, with this public key has authorized this transaction. The weird thing, as if you can probably tell from malleability, is that you can actually change the transaction and it will remain valid. For any given transaction, there are two valid signatures. And if you know one valid signature, you also can determine the other and produce the signature for the same transaction. So the transaction ID will change because the signature has changed, but the signature is still valid. So it's a different transaction with the same inputs and outputs, but a different ID. So how can this be exploited? Well, say that your Mt. Gox, which was an exchange back in the day that got hacked, and this is a theory actually as to how they got hacked. So they produce a transaction, a valid transaction to some client or some customer, some user, and this transaction has cleared, meaning that it's been processed by the blockchain, there's been a sufficient number of confirmations, but the client says, hey, I didn't get my transaction, here it is they send back a mutated transaction with the, I guess, opposite signature, the one that's not actually the one that was produced by Mt. Gox, but it is one that is a valid signature. However, since transaction one has a mutated transaction ID, Mt. Gox is only looking for the one that it produced. It's looking for that specific transaction ID. So at step two, the attacker says, hey, I didn't get these funds, give me the funds. And Mt. Gox in step three says, oh, you're right. This is a valid transaction, it's a valid ID, but I don't see it on chain. Therefore, I should give you the funds. And then they will send a new transaction in which they send the same funds. So on chain, they did not register that the transaction that they had made actually did get processed. And the transaction that was given to them was never a transaction that they had themselves made. And so because of this faulty logic, they were incapable of distinguishing, or at least this is a theory again, incapable of distinguishing the difference between transaction one and the mutated transaction one. And so this is another blockchain level bug that was solved with segregated witness or segwit, which took signatures out of the transactions, meaning that the signature identification 
hash was no longer dependent on the signature data. So even if someone mutated the signature, they would not be able to mutate the transaction itself. And therefore this bug could never happen. So those are both very interesting bugs and they happened because of you know, compromises that were made. Someone did not choose to, to have this implemented at the network layer, trusting that people who are watching the blockchain would be able to interpret it. The same way that TCP does not have any inherent encryption, you have to build that on top of that protocol. All right, so it's a question of trade-offs again. So are there any questions about blockchain level bugs, about those bugs in particular, or about what blockchain level security entails? Yeah, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, uh, Nadir, I have two questions. So uh, the first one is for the, um, for the overflow bug, did they end up having to do a hard fork to resolve it? So for the overflow bug, they did a soft fork. Um, the reason it was a soft fork is because you are now restricting the types of transactions that can be made. You're not actually saying there's anything new that can be done. You're saying these transactions that were valid before were only accepting the right. ones that don't have overflows and don't have more than 21 million Bitcoin. It took about five hours for that patch to come out. And because there was so little hash rate, it was very easy to make that fix. And they kind of were able to effectively reverse this transaction. They were able to undo it, yes. Um, they okay. just forked it from back wherever from it was. behind, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And then uh, on the second one, on transaction malleability, my question is, I, my understanding so far was that a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, also refers to the UTXO in the input. And so if you just change the signature and therefore change the transaction ID, it should still be protected against a double spend attack because it would be referring to the same UTXO for the input. I mean, right. So this is true in that if, uh, so this is actually a, process, a problem with Mt. Gox in tandem with the, the Bitcoin blockchain. So it is true that just changing the signature is not going to change the UTXOs. Those UTXOs are still spent and you can't send transaction one prime to the right. network. However, Mt. Gox was saying, I guess these UTXOs never cleared. Let me submit a different transaction that has a new set of UTXOs. Okay. okay. They Thank were sending you. the same amount, but with different, uh, different Bitcoins. So it was double spending legitimately from their funds, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Of course. I have, a, um, have one quick, or you can go ahead. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I was wondering what the Nakamoto style or BFD was in the decisions to make. Of course. So Nakamoto style, um, I'm not sure how popular a term that is. I've seen it in a few places. I use it as well. It refers to how we have resources for voting instead of identities. So with traditional distributed systems, you have a set of nodes and you know the set of nodes ahead of time. You control these set of nodes and these nodes will vote between themselves as to what the truth is. That voting process is Byzantine fault tolerance style in which you have like a set of nodes, a set of explicit rounds, typically all are owned by the same entity. They're all trusted by each other in the sense that they're all like going to function a particular way, but they may be corrupted. Nakamoto style oops, is instead you have no knowledge of how many people there are in the network. You have no knowledge of how much power they might have or how many identities they might have. So you want to tie your voting power, not to any identity, but to resources, like how Bitcoin has proof of work and Tenderman has proof of stake. All these proof of some things are typically Nakamoto style because you can have any number of identities and it will not affect your voting capabilities. It's only the amount of resources you have that affects your voting capabilities. Oh, uh, okay. So BFD style is like, um... If you have more people, that's more powerful, but Nakamoto is more like the computing power and like just confirming each other using code. Yeah, I would All say right. BFT style is typically voting explicitly and Nakamoto yeah. style is voting implicitly with resources. Okay, oh, yeah. cool, thank you. Of course, and I will say also that BFT style and finality usually go hand in hand because with BFT style, you need two thirds or more consensus. Whereas with Nakamoto, you typically just go for the longest chain or the heaviest chain or however you define that. You had one more question, Nishan? Uh, yeah. 
just uh like a blockchain security in general type thing so like with attacks like mount gox and stuff mm -hmm. like you can see like they they might like people might like say trust in bitcoin a little bit less and like now that like blockchain security is a nascent like area and so like these things might happen like what do you do in blockchain security kind of to kind of like bring trust back like what do you what do you say to like people who like are like oh yeah bitcoin is hacked can be hacked that's a stuff. really good question and i will preface it by saying that blockchain security as a blockchain security person it's not my responsibility to convince anyone one way or yeah. the other however of course the the goal is to very clearly delineate where the problems were like you shouldn't attribute blame to anyone who doesn't deserve it regardless of what field you're in and i think the same goes for blockchain security like the blame doesn't necessarily go to Bitcoin. It also goes to Mt. Gox for failing mm -hmm. to handle these types of situations. Yeah. Now it is sort of the case that if Bitcoin did it natively or at the blockchain level, it wouldn't be a problem, but it still has a large amount of oversight on the side of the exchange. It's like saying that someone who uses the internet who doesn't encrypt their traffic yeah. should blame the internet, right? The internet's just doing its thing. It's not saying it claims to do that for you. Mm -hmm. You have to understand it in order to be able to do that. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I guess like I guess then people just always make the argument of like I guess there's there could be someone else who messes up there the way that they interact with Bitcoin like Mt. Gox did. But yeah, I, almost, I guess it's a tough problem. Yeah. Yeah, I would say the best way to summarize that is if someone's mm -hmm. concerned about the security of their blockchain, it just means that they don't understand it, and that's natural. Like whenever we don't yeah. understand something, we typically think that's where a problem might happen because we just don't know that there's a solution there. Yeah. So the proof relies entirely in the work we do. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? All right. Those are some good questions. Let's talk now about layer two, the application. And now that we're talking about the application, we're saying the networking works correctly the blockchain works correctly, we're still using a blockchain, but now we're building something on top of this blockchain, like a smart contract or like a layer two scaling solution like Lightning. We're using the blockchain in order to make a separate thing happen, or thing on top of it happen. And this application, it doesn't affect the consensus of the blockchain. The blockchain doesn't care if the application is losing money or getting hacked, the blockchain is just doing its job. It's the application's responsibility to consider in the context of a blockchain how it's supposed to be built so that it can do its job correctly. So with applications, there's one very famous application. I'm sure you've heard this before, but I wanted to reiterate it just to be able to talk about it. Um, these are Genesis slides from, I think, a few lectures back. The DAO hack was, of course, the most prominent hack back in 2016, in which a huge amount of funds were stolen out of the smart contract. And in the smart contract, the idea was that people can propose to send tokens to one company or another in order to give them funding, in order to do stuff. So they raised a huge amount of money, but they got hacked. And now the question is, of course, why they got hacked. Because when we look at the hack, we think, oh, that's so obvious, right? Of course they should have done, done it the correct way. But if any one of us were writing that, I don't think we would have noticed because of the fact that one, it's hidden in a deep amount of code, and two, it's nothing we've ever seen before in this context. So to reiterate what the hack actually was, so the creators of the DAO, they implemented an ability for the DAO to be split into two or to transfer tokens from one group to another. And someone who was looking at this procedure or this function found a loophole or something that was an oversight. The way the function worked was that it said, if the funds are sent to this person, then go ahead and deduct their balance. The problem here is that this person wasn't thinking in the context of blockchain. And in the context of blockchain, when you make an external call to someone, they are able to then do whatever they want before the computation goes back to the original contract. So when this person had control of the computational flow, they were able to go and call that same function again. So this function in the DAO is trying to redeem funds. It calls another person. That person calls back that same function, and it says, oh, this person's balance hasn't changed. It's still this much. They can still redeem this much. Let me go ahead and try to send it to them again. 
and if it's sent, I'll deduct it again. And they just kept calling it and kept calling it until eventually it was drained. And it was because of that one oversight that those two lines were out of order that this entire contract was hacked and Ethereum Classic was born because Ethereum Classic said, we're not undoing this. And everyone else said, no, we're undoing it. We lost too much money and it's too early in the process for us to accept it. So of course, it's another question of mutability. Is code law? That's a topic for another time. But the point is that they were trying to do something that no one had ever done before. And it was very, I don't know, it's very sad to think that someone had actually discovered the bug and was about to report it, but it was just about then that the hack was actually about to happen. So maybe we would not have learned about the importance of smart contract security if this hack had never happened. Who knows? The point is that they were trying to do something new and they got burned for it. They were able to recover their losses with what I imagine or hope is a once in a lifetime reversal of the blockchain. But this is something that is still being exploited because people just are not learning from history. They're not paying attention. They're trying to build stuff and they're still getting burned. And so this is now known as like the re-entrancy vulnerability or recursive call exploit, as I suppose some might call it. And so that was, that was the, the one hack that sort of kickstarted this whole smart contract security movement. When people who had never done security before now realized there was this huge, huge reason to learn this stuff because even simple stuff that you would be able to recognize in other contexts, like overflow vulnerabilities, these have been known for decades. And it, it's still happening because people who are doing this stuff in the blockchain space, they haven't worked with this type of systems oriented you know, uh, processes before. So because it's all new, they don't have the past experience to inform them, at least a lot of the ones who end up causing this stuff. However, it's not necessarily the case that only amateurs make these kinds of mistakes. It's also people who have been in the space, if not invented the space, that are experiencing these kinds of issues. So Parity is a company that's responsible for, for multiple, as they put it on the website, core blockchain solutions, such as a multi-sig wallet or multi-signature wallet, which I'll explain in a bit, an Ethereum client, essentially a, uh, a way for someone to be able to interface with the Ethereum blockchain, and Polkadot, their special interoperable blockchain network. So we'll talk about how the first one the wallets got popped or hacked twice in the span of a few months. So I'll go ahead and describe what a multi-sig wallet is just to make sure that we're all on the same page. It is a wallet that allows for a single account or a single address or whatever you may want to call it to allow for multiple users to produce valid signatures from that account requiring a minimum threshold. To put it in a more tangible way, if you consider a two of three multi-sig wallet, it is a wallet that requires two signatures from a total of three privileged users. So for those of you who are visual learners like myself, this is what a multi-sig wallet might look like. Say there are three people, Derek, Rusty, and Gloria. All three of them are friends that are starting their own startup, but they don't trust each other. Not that they hate each other or anything, they just don't want any one person to have complete control of the funds that they raised for their startup. So they decide to create this multi-signature wallet and between the three of them, two out of three keys they decided are required in order to open this wallet. So when two of them submit their signatures to the wallet authorizing a transaction, it gets submitted to the network and whoever's on the receiving end, the lucky person, myself in this case, gets to receive those funds. Or it can refer to any kind of activity. It's most typically used for funds because those are the things that are really essential to make sure that they're not lost easily. Because say that Derek alone is some, for some reason, he wants to spite his friends because they didn't remember his birthday and so he stole all their money. He can't do it by himself now because it requires two out of three. Of course, if Rusty and Gloria, for some reason, hate Derek, they could piss him off and take the money themselves. But at that point, it's a question of, you know, what trade-offs do you make? Do you require three out of three signatures? Um, in this case, two out of three is a way to have at least one other person confirm that the transaction you're trying to make is legitimate. Another use case is if Rusty just 
wants a backup key. Say that he, for some reason, ends up losing keys. So every time he makes a transaction, he wants to use two out of three keys. If for some reason, or it could be a company that's doing this for him. If for some reason he loses one key, then there's somewhere else that he can get a backup from in order to be able to continue spending funds from his wallet. And maybe he'll transfer it to a new multi-sig wallet with a new set of keys. So this is what a multi-sig wallet is. There are some number of people with keys and a subset of them are able to spend funds from that wallet. And all of this is defined when the wallet is instantiated or configured upon creation. So are there any questions about what a multi-sig wallet is or how it works? Cool. So now that we have an understanding or a model of what a multi-sig wallet looks like, let's look at how it got hacked. This is a diagram that, so, that shows what the multi-sig wallet design is of parity. It's really straightforward, so feel free to ask if you have questions, but the general idea is that you have one proxy contract. That is the interface that users interact with. And this proxy contract will ask the logic contract for all of the actual logic that it needs to execute anything meaningful. So the proxy contract has a fallback function, and this function says, is there data with this transaction? If there is, go to the logic contract and figure out how to do this logic. So the logic contract has all the meaningful functions. It has init wallet, transfer, transfer from maybe. It has a bunch of different functions, and proxy contract is only there so that individual users can establish their own configurations and so that they can have their own separated states. So an attacker was able to drain the funds from this wallet, from any wallet that uses the system with only two calls, one to the fallback function in the proxy contract and the other to redeem the funds out of the contract. The reason this was possible is because in the proxy contract, there was a fallback function that didn't really check for much. It just said, if there's data, go to the logic contract and execute the appropriate function. And the logic contract had a function called init wallet. And this function did not check whether or not the contract was previously initialized. Initializations, as the name implies, should only be done once. Yet there was no precondition saying, do this only if uninitialized. And it was because of that oversight, along with the fact that the proxy contract forwarded arbitrary calls to the logic contract, that this hack was able to be done. So if you ever hear the word arbitrary, beware. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the contract or with whatever piece of software you're working with. It just means you should be especially wary because in any arbitrary realm of things, there's probably at least one example of something you don't want to see. So this was the example in this particular case where someone called init wallet after the contract was already initialized. So what happens? The proxy contract says, oh, someone wants to init wallet. Logic contract, how do I init wallet? Logic contract says, here's how you init wallet. Go ahead and do that. And the proxy contract says, okay, I have initialized with the parameters I have been given. And the attacker gave the parameters being one, you, one owner and the owner being themselves. And so they could do whatever they wanted with this multi-sig wallet because they had taken over the other person's credentials, whatever other group of people were using this wallet. They had replaced their credentials with their own. And so the attacker could now do whatever they wanted with that person's wallet. And a little funny story is that the way this was stopped, no one was able act, actually able to stop the hack before it happened. But what they did do was something along the lines of National Treasure. If you've ever seen National Treasure, you know that Nicolas Cage goes to steal the Declaration of Independence, not because he's a bad person, but because he's trying to steal it before other people can steal it. And in the same way, a bunch of white hat hackers had gone into these contracts and exploited the attack for the sake of holding onto those funds on behalf of the users before the attacker could get to them. And at the end, there was this distribution of funds back to the, the rightful owners, so to say, whatever could be sent back, which I think is a really interesting way to, to try to solve that hack, which is the only one that they could do with such short notice. 
So are there any questions about how this hack actually happened, about why this hack was possible? I'm kind of wondering like why these developers, why would they even allow people to like, like, I mean, allow like arbitrary calls or anything like that. Why would they like have that in there in the first place? Like, is it for like just ease of development? Just like, oh yeah, like we're okay. And then just like assume that they're okay. Like, so yeah. my guess, of course, I can't speak for the developers, but my guess <laughs> would be what you said, ease of development. If you have one logic contract, if you want everyone to be able to upgrade their logic, they don't need to deploy a new contract. They just have to point to a new logic contract. So if they wanted to fix a bug in the logic, they could say, hey, everyone using our wallets, please change this pointer or change this address to be this other logic contract. And everyone says, yeah. okay, I guess I'll upgrade. Yeah. If everyone okay. were to have the logic locally or in their yeah. own contract and they're all separate, then you'd say, hey, everyone, please transfer your funds over to this other wallet that you will be deploying. And then that would be a lot trickier. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. Would you say like a lot of these, like? In the earlier days, like it's just because there weren't enough like blockchain security experts, like there weren't enough like like considerations for security, really. So the reason I mentioned that even the people who invent these protocols are the yeah. ones that are messing up is because Gavin Wood and someone else are the CEO and or CTO and CEO respectively of um, Parity, and mm -hmm. they were both Ethereum co-founders, and yeah, yeah. they were the people who developed Ethereum. So for them to be the ones that were leading companies that got hacked like this, it goes to show that really even the people who built it don't fully understand it until it actually happens to them. Yeah, yeah. I was I was about to say like it feels like like there's no like there's no like it feels like damn if these guys are able to get hacked or something like that, like is anyone safe or anything like that? Like how do you know if anyone's safe, especially? All right, I guess that's an open question though. No, yeah, that's definitely <laughs> a good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's because this guy was the one who wrote the Ethereum yellow paper where he describes mm -hmm. the EVM in yeah. its entirety. Yeah. So if someone who knows the ins and outs that well does not, is not able, or if that guy is the CTO for a company where this happens, who yeah, can actually? Yeah. So I would say it was not a matter of a lack of blockchain security expertise so much as it was a a lack of um, controls because if he wanted i'm sure that they could have found this eventually if they had enough people yeah. looking at it but they That's simply true. didn't have the controls in place in order to ensure that this was caught in time good point yeah. and to show how the controls were still not there this was also for context in july 2018 so this was a while ago okay yeah yeah are security standards in blockchain security really hard to like make as well? Because like when you think of, this is a simplified example, but like if you look at like, I don't know, just like a regular application, you can like, it's been developing for so long that you kind of know things to look out for, like things that you want, like they're simplified, but like, oh, okay, are they using like two-factor authentication or something? That's good. Like, is that also like a problem that needs to be built towards just like having standards and stuff like that? Without a doubt. The best thing in security is not to have to think about it. The reason security exists is not to tell you you can't do something, it's to tell you here's how you do it in the least risky way possible. The same way that lawyers will always tell you, this thing's kind of sketchy, but here's how you can make it a little bit less sketchy, right? So with standards like two-factor authentication, SQL injection protection, cross-site scripting, um, mm -hmm. server-side or uh, cross-site request forgery, all of these things, they have names because someone went out and exploited it. Right. So all of these standards are only going to develop faster as we see more of these failures, which is kind that of important. Sense. But it doesn't mean that there's anything inherently wrong with blockchain security. It's just the fact that right. it's new. And the more we can draw from old learnings, the faster yeah. we'll be able to get to those standards that you're describing. True, nice. Cool, does that answer your question? Yeah, question? yeah it does, thanks. Nice. Awesome. Any other questions? I have like a random question. Are there any like companies out there that like try to hack blockchains to exploit these things before like malicious people actually do? Interesting that you mention it. There's no companies that, when you say try to hack, do you mean in a legal slash helpful way or in a, I want to get money? Yeah, out? like in order to like, yeah, like a legal way where you try to figure out like 
the weaknesses and the security, like the recursive things and so forth? Yeah, definitely. There are lots of companies. Well, there are definitely companies out there. I hesitate to say lots because compared to traditional application security and stuff, there's not as many. But there are definitely mm-hmm. like a few out there that are just white hat hackers trying to collect bug bounties so that they can, you know, secure the network while still making some money. So bug bounties are the primary yeah. way in which these people will make money, aside from building their own tools as well or doing audits. Mm. So is, is there not as much like bug bounties for a lot of these blockchain technologies compared to like the other more like traditional things because of like it's more of like a niche field and there's like new companies so the startups don't have as much money and so forth? Yeah, I would hesitate to say that there aren't as many bug bounties, but that the bug bounties are much more difficult to get to a large number of people because the demand for blockchain security is much higher than the Uh, capacity. The people who would know blockchain security are the ones trying to build the stuff, but they're also disincentivized to slow down. So they, I mean, in the last year or so, it's gotten much better. Most of the projects are no longer just trying to like hit the accelerator and go as fast as they can. They're conscious of the breaks of the security. And so they build out bug bounties more frequently nowadays that I've noticed in order to ensure proper launches. Um, yeah, and it's also the case that before when you had a bug bounty, it was mostly like, it was, it was mostly, you knew the people who were doing the bug bounty because the community was so tight. So you didn't really have to go out of your way to create a generic bug bounty. You just asked people you knew. Oh, uh, okay, cool, thank you. Of course. Nadir, I also just wanted to mention, uh, I don't, maybe you probably already know, but Open Zeppelin uh, was something interesting I came across recently. They have like, um, you know, libraries of contracts or reusable code and SDKs to develop contracts. And then they also offer security audits when you're ready. It's, it, I think it's a, just a group of people that have done this enough if people want to get another pair of eyes on before they go to production. Yeah, I'm happy you point that out because Open Zeppelin is is what we need in the blockchain space in order for people to do security right. Um, To reiterate uh, what was mentioned by Dhruv. Yeah. 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 So Open Zeppelin is a a company that has a public GitHub where you can pull smart contract code for a lot of different kinds of standards for ERC-20s, ERC-721s, or the NFTs, uh, CryptoKitty style tokens non-fungible tokens. Uh, Basically, they build out a lot of this code and they iterate over it for years with tons of discussion about a single line of code just so that you can have a a lot more confidence in the security of of your code. And I think what was mentioned by Kentaro was that you don't have, like you do have a lot of like white hack hackers, but they'll most often put their skills towards auditing or preventatively inspecting these things. So companies will say, hey, Open Zeppelin or Trail of Bits or Quantstamp or some other security firm that does blockchain related stuff, can you look at this thing and give me the seal of approval? Because of a lot of exchanges, they got burned by these hacks. Because if someone can mint billions of tokens, they can go to an exchange and withdraw a bunch of money really fast. And the exchange won't realize what's happened until it's too late. So a lot of exchanges are enforcing this sort of audit prerequisite before they can get listed to avoid getting burned themselves. And so the exchange is what's sort of driving a lot of this preventative security after the fact in the more recent years. Yeah, just some fun facts for all you. Cool, are there any other questions? (laughs) Yeah, what Simon mentioned today for homework, you will be a white hat hacker. You've got to try out some smart contract hacks All right, well, if there are no more questions, I will go ahead and talk about the second time this multi-sig wallet got hacked because apparently once was not enough. And this is really, really strange to think about that the same contracts got hacked within the span of a few months. You'd think that after one hack, there would be a change in the process and they would be more conscientious of attack vectors, but it seemed that it was not necessarily the case. There was a previous solution to this problem to add a modifier to ensure that it had not been initialized before. And so this modifier was to make sure that init wallet was only called or only able to be executed if there were no 
owners of this contract. So if the owners were greater than one or greater than zero, sorry, one or greater, then you could not reinitialize the contract. So you couldn't take the rug out from under someone else's feet and take away their funds. The consequence, however, was that when they redeployed this logic contract, no one had initialized this logic contract. And it sounds really strange to think about a logic contract having some form of state, but the, the hack here wasn't even through the proxy contract. This time, they circumvented the proxy contract and directly called the logic contract they performed two transactions. The first one being directly calling it to initialize it. And the second one being, of course, the obvious thing you do when you've gotten control of a contract that governs tens of millions of dollars of money is you kill it. And so this GitHub post on the top right is actually one of the funniest and most heartbreaking things I've seen where someone says they accidentally killed it. And this was posted on the parity multisig GitHub. And it was just the sheer idea of someone accidentally doing this that was confusing to a lot of people. Because how do you accidentally kill one of these contracts? I mean, what had happened was this logic contract was just like any other contract. It was a contract that had the ability to have states, to have owners, to make transactions, and to self-destruct as well when it wasn't necessary or when someone had decided that they wanted to destroy it. But the consequence of the self-destruction was the fact that there was no longer any pointer to the logic contract. So all of these proxy contracts, they're asking this address, hey, can you give me logic? And the address is silent because it's, it's dead. And so the proxy contract says, hey, I don't know what to do. I'm just not gonna do anything. So $20 million in Ethereum or in Ether, I think were effectively frozen. I think that's about the number. Um, but yeah, that was the second hack that happened to this multi-sig wallet. And this is the dangers not only of like ensuring proper um, preconditions, but just of the dangers of cross-contract calls, of depending on things that are outside of your own smart contract. So if you were ever to develop a smart contract, you have to ask yourself, is the, the functionality or the modularity that I get from having separate contracts that call each other worth the risk of the dependencies that I'm now putting between these different calls or the, oh, the in increase in attack surface that I've created by the complexity that I'm adding to the system. And so this is like two different bugs, the same exact product. So are there any questions about how this happened and why it froze all the funds? Alrighty. Well, if there are any other questions, feel free to ask, else we'll take a 10 minute break and go ahead and go to layer three, the integration right after this. Cool. So let's talk about layer three, the integration. And what do we mean when we say integration? Well, we've developed you know, this idea that we have some networking thing that we can use to communicate with peers. We have a blockchain for distributed consensus. We have applications that might be built on this blockchain. And now we want to integrate with the applications and with the blockchain. So these integrations are the last step in the entire process of developing a product or a user facing thing that is gonna do something meaningful. The integrations might be like a wallet that holds onto private keys and allows you to send funds to people. Or it might be a website that allows you to track who owns which crypto kitties. All of these things need on-chain information or need to interact with some application like the Lightning Network, like some other thing that's built on top of it in order to do something meaningful. So this kind of falls into the realm of traditional application security. And these are a bunch of vulnerabilities that you may have heard before. They don't require blockchain knowledge in order to do successfully. Like app or integration, security can involve all of these things, like making sure this stuff is safe. And primarily it can involve asking the question of like, how are we tracking balances? How are we sending calls to the blockchain? How are we ensuring that what happens on chain is correctly represented by what we consider to be the truth? And I'll actually give an example from something that was publicly disclosed by Coinbase. Um, again, this is just an interesting 
case study. This is not me giving any opinion or anything like that. I'm not representing Coinbase. Um, so anything I'm saying is just me trying to give a pragmatic view of what happened. And if you want more info, you're always free to look at the source. So Coinbase, as I mentioned before, is an exchange for cryptocurrencies, and it made a mistake in the way that it parsed transactions over two years ago. And so the issue happened actually as a mistake. Someone was trying to develop a Christmas gift for their family. And this Christmas gift was meant to send out Ether to all of these different Coinbase addresses. The problem was that this product that they developed, this Christmas gift thing, didn't work correctly. So if you called it, it failed. But someone on the other end said, hey, I actually got my Ether, the two Ether that you sent me through Coinbase. Thank you very much. And so the person who made this is like, what's going on? Why did it work when it failed on chain? And so they placed a bug, or they submitted a bug bounty and Coinbase said, holy moly, this could have drained our entire hot wallet, which is, you know, it could be a lot of money. So it was a big deal and they wanted to understand why that happened. So here's what happened that caused money to be sent from one person to another via Coinbase that didn't actually represent what was happening on chain. So say you have a contract and this contract has a series of, ad of addresses to send money to. The first, however many are legitimate, but the last one is an address that is designed to fail, like a contract that always reverts, something like that. So in this transaction, you'll see contract one sends money to address one, sends money to address two, all the way down to the final contract where it sends money to this final contract. But inside of the final contract, there's a revert. So what happens if there's a revert during the transaction? The entire transaction gets reverted. So everything else is supposed to get unwinded. However, Coinbase wasn't seeing it like this. It saw it as, okay, send one to address one happened, send two to address two happened, send to final contract happened. It never confirmed that the final send actually successfully completed. It didn't see this nested revert. And so because of that, it didn't actually reverse the transactions and incremented the balances and credited the deposits of every single legitimate Coinbase address. So if you want to drain the accounts, what you'd say is from contract one, I'm sending 50 Ether to all these addresses, and then I'm failing the final contract. And Coinbase would say, okay, these are all legitimate, not seeing the final revert. And so this had nothing to do with an error in the blockchain. It was an error in the way that Coinbase was parsing the transactions that it was seeing on chain. And it was that error that was fixed by simply making sure that there was, you know, there was a, going to be a revert if at any point during the transaction, a revert opcode was signaled. So does that make sense as to why this happened and why it falls in the integration category of bugs? Cool, well, do feel free to ask. Um, this is, again, a really interesting bug because of the fact that you know, it's, it's something so minute and yet it has such tremendous ramifications. And you don't really need to understand blockchain to know that this is a problem. I mean, you do need to understand it if you're trying to interpret the, the output of the EVM. But just to know like, oh, if the balance changes here, if there's a revert here, you shouldn't credit the deposit. That's something that falls more into traditional business logic and you don't need that specialized blockchain knowledge as much anymore. And another one I want to mention is a really interesting one, just for fun. Um, well, not just for fun, but it also shows the dangers of knowing where you have your money saved. So on January 14th, 2019, this is about a year and a fourth ago, Quadriga CX, which is an, a can, or was a Canadian exchange, the founder and CEO, Gerald Cotton, had died. And it was announced by his wife that he died due to complications with Crohn's disease about a month earlier, December 9th, 2018, while traveling in India, where he was opening an orphanage for children in need. And they shared a link with his profile, but that was no longer functional when I had looked at it about a year ago. And so this is already kind of strange. Um, a couple days later, some users start complaining about some long Bitcoin withdrawal times. It's taking over 24 hours, which is unusual because you just want to get your Bitcoin out. That's the problem, right? It's not like the Bitcoin blockchain was slowed down. It was the, probably the exchange that wasn't fulfilling the request. 
And the exchange's Twitter account said that it was because of higher demand for crypto and that wallets are constantly being refilled. A couple weeks later, the exchange went offline with no prior announcement. The website stated that there were unannounced system upgrades for the reason being offline. But on Reddit, a lot of people were starting to suspect an exit scam. And for those of you who may not know, an exit scam, as it sounds, is a way to get out of the problem you're in by just getting out of there. So a lot of people speculated that Quadriga was trying to you know, re get whatever it could, not pay back its users, and possibly connecting this to the death of the CEO. So some background on Quadriga is that they had about 115,000 users. They owed 70 million Canadian dollars in fiat and 180 million in crypto. It's unknown what amount of crypto was in their cold wallets. They said that their hot wallets only held a minimum amount of funds or a minimal amount of funds. And this is a good point. You don't want coins in your hot wallets if you don't need to use them. But if, you're user, if your users are trying to withdraw their funds, they should be able to do that within a reasonable amount of time. And that very day, they filed for creditor protection, which is essentially bankruptcy. And they were doing this because they alleged that after the CEO's death, they no longer had access to their inventory of cryptocurrency and that some of it may have be been lost. Uh, and they claimed that this one person had the sole responsibility of handling the funds and coins. And he was the custodian of this many tokens, as you can see here, according to what they said. And that the exchange then owed their customers $190 million because this one person died and no one thought to ask, hey, can you make a backup of this key? And this is why multi-sig would also be useful. Anyway, so people started to investigate themselves. They weren't too satisfied with this answer. And the CEO of Kraken actually instigated some investigations into the transaction history of Quadriga and found a connection between Quadriga and Mt. Gox, the other failed uh, exchange. And it turned out that some addresses that were associated with Mt. Gox have been sending funds to a wallet associated with Quadriga. And this wasn't so much like anything provably wrong. It was just a weird coincidence that two strange, <laughs> yeah, the moral stories make backups or multi-sig. It was just a coincidence that two strange and failed exchanges or failing exchanges were now being connected in some way. Um, however, there was evidence discovered that Quadriga never lost a hold of its funds. For whatever reason, on-chain data was able to say that, hey, this person's funds are moving, and they claimed that they didn't have access to the funds. So again, very strange. And if this wasn't strange enough, a bunch of people on Twitter started saying, hey, let's have Kraken buy out Quadriga. <laughs> yeah, someone definitely got paid. Someone got paid, but we still don't really know who. And it didn't have too many supporters because you know they were asking Qu Kraken to basically honor the debts of Quadriga and pay it off. Um, but if that wasn't strange enough already, one of the co-founders used a fake name, which was not a plot twist that I was expecting, quite honestly. Um, the co-founder, Michael Patron, is actually a person by the name of Omar Danani, who was a convicted criminal charged with fraud for his role in operating an online marketplace for identity theft. And no one's really sure where he is, and I haven't checked in on him in over a year, so we're still not really sure where he is. But the fact that this criminal, a scam artist, was a co-founder of this exchange that is now going through this stuff is not a great, it's not a great sign. And on top of that, they were given time to restructure their financial situation in order to avoid bankruptcy. But at least we have one sort of uh, useful thing is that, I don't know if it's useful, it kind of sounds bad to say now that I've said it out loud, but Gerald Cotton was officially declared dead given this death certificate that was discovered um, with the same death date, the same location. Um, so either he didn't fake his death or he did so very well. But there was no conclusion to like what actually happened with this exchange. This is all to say that ownership of keys is very important. And not only that, but even though we have legal ramifications against exchanges that do this stuff, it's not always a guarantee that the stuff will get fixed. And as is crypto, sometimes biz bizarre things just happen. So 
the, the moral of this story is make sure you are assessing the risks that you are taking on. If you're trusting another person or another company with your keys, make sure you're comfortable with that. If you're trusting yourself with your keys, make sure you're comfortable with that. Because if you lose them, no one else can get them back. So there's always these trade-offs to be made and a lot of strange things happen. So understanding as much experience, as many failures as you can from the space is as useful as possible to getting an understanding for what is and what is not good practice. Because it's only through learning from our mistakes that we're able to make these good standards and make better decisions overall. So hopefully the people involved in this will never run a cryptocurrency exchange again, but we'll find out. Anyway, are there any, any questions about sort of the integration model of this, about how all of these different components that are happening on chain are now attempted to be replicated off chain? And even small issues with either the way keys are handled or the way information is processed can lead to a tremendous loss of funds. Not necessarily the actual loss, but at least the potential for loss. Cool. In which case, hopefully, that gives you a lot more context on sort of the, the blockchain security space and gives you some ideas as to what we're dealing with when we talk about blockchain security. So now we're going to go ahead and talk about something that's really interesting, I hope, for all of you who are perhaps excited by this stuff. We're gonna talk about Capture the Ether. So Capture the Ether is an online challenge where you can actually test yourself to find out, am I capable of hacking some real world bugs? So the homepage is actually you just go to capturetheether.com and you'll be able to access this entire thing for free. All you need is some test ether. So this is actually going to be part of your homework that you'll be doing today. And in order to give you some context of what you're gonna be doing, I'm gonna go ahead and walk you through one of the examples. So these three up here, warmups, are just for you to get familiar with the Capture the Ether setup. It'll teach you how to deploy a contract, how to interact with a contract, and how to submit interesting information to a contract. All of the stuff is pretty straightforward, but we're not actually going to require you to do any of this stuff. We'll be asking you to explain how you would if you were to hack one of these contracts. So let's start by going to one of these contracts and seeing what we can do. So this contract here is asking, can you guess the number? It's very straightforward. Right, so there's three different things that are in this contract, three, three different functions. Uh, the first function being the constructor. The constructor takes in one ether. It just starts off with that amount. The second function is complete. It checks whether or not the address, or whether the balance of this contract is zero. If the balance is zero, then the challenge is complete. So you'll ask, okay, how do I get the balance to zero? Well, you can get the balance to zero if you can get to this command line right here. So let's go ahead and bring that up. So if you can get to this line right here, message.sender.transfer to ether, you can get out all the funds. But how do you get to that? You need to pass this condition right here, if n equals answer. So what are the conditions for getting this ether out of the contract? Well, one, you need to call this function with one ether, and two, you need to submit whatever value, whatever argument here, is gonna get this condition to be true, which means that n has to equal the answer. And I'm being very explicit in how I break this problem down because you have to understand very, very definitively what the invariants are that you're trying to protect or break when doing this stuff. So for this one, you might ask yourself, okay, it seems pretty straightforward. I see the answer is 42 right up there. Uh, I just have to put in 42, right? There's nothing else to it. And yeah, that's correct. With blockchains, all the information is public. You cannot rely on any private variable to protect you from the, the large range of attackers that can get this information easily. So the solution to this question is just checking to see whether or not you know how to like interpret that and actually solve the puzzle. So this puzzle in particular is pretty straightforward. Now we'll go to the next puzzle, but for this one, we'll have you all go out into breakout rooms. 
So here's the puzzle. And I can also link this in the chat for you all very quickly. Uh, now I'd like you all to discuss as to what exactly would be your solution. How could you figure out this puzzle? Because it's asking you to reverse engineer a hash, or not reverse engineer, but like to, to undo a hash, right? And that's difficult. It's not easy. So Simon, do you want to kick off the breakout rooms? Yeah, I'm going to create it right now. I'll put you all in breakout rooms. All right, uh, you guys should got the invite already. Cool. So does anyone have, after their breakout session, either if you want to type or if you want to say it out loud, any idea as to first steps, perhaps, or even full solutions for how to tackle this problem? Um, so I noticed that the guess uses, is a unit to eight. So can't you just brute force to 255 values and then find the one that matches? Sure. So how would you do that? I guess you just need to you just need to know the same fun hash function that Ethereum's using. So I think that's SHA three. So you just run the two you run the two hundred fifty five numbers through that hash function and check if any of them match the answer hash. Exactly. That's precisely what you do. So Billy, can you tell me what the what you think the developer was going for here and what assumption was broken when you were able to brute force this hash function so easily? Uh, I think he thought that like just because he's using a hash, it's irreversible. But since the input size or input not range is so small, you can just brute force the input and not reverse the hash. Perfectly put. That's exactly it. When we think of a hash, we get intimidated. We think, oh, there's no way that we can get the input for a hash, right? But when we say that, we're assuming that we have a large amount of, of inputs. So, Billy, do you want to explain, for Kintaro, or explain to Kentaro why we only have 255 integers or up to 255? Um, so the function guess takes in the u into 8 n. And u int 8 means that it's an integer with 8 bits. So it can only range from like 0 to 255. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah exactly. So if this person used u int 256, then we may never have been able to solve this challenge because of the fact that the input space is way too big to be able to brute force it. But because u int 8 is only 256 different operations of hashing, it's very easy and very possible to do. And so that's how all of these security challenges go. They take something that looks pretty, like once you figure it out, you're like, there's no way that someone would actually do that. But almost each of these challenges comes from someone having made a mistake very publicly and everyone remembering that mistake to make sure they don't do it themselves. So your homework will be, to the same way that Billy just did, explain for challenges of your choosing out of the set that we have selected, which ones you think you'd like to try to solve. Um, you won't have to actually interact with it. You'll simply describe what the issue was with the contract and how you were able to break it. And so that will get you into the mindset of like, all right, what are the th things that are new about blockchain that I want to consider? Everything's public, how does that affect this? Um, are there overflow differences? Are there issues with the way that it accounts for balance? All of these are interesting, different things that you may encounter when doing these challenges. So Simon, if you'd like to share the homework or... Yeah, I'll email, email the form afterwards. Um, yeah, so basically what it will be, it will be a Google form. It'll have three questions. You pick any of the three challenges that we haven't talked about on the site. And uh, as long as they're not, you know, uh, the beginner ones or guess the number or guess the secret number um so you write like a couple of sentences about what you think the flaw is and how you can attack it just like very simple couple of sentences uh, for any of the three challenges and that's the homework check out cool so are there any questions about either guess the number guess the secret number or anything else around blockchain security that you'd like to ask oh um just for fun could you show us like how to actually interact with it and like 
send through MetaMask and stuff? Sure thing. I'd love to do that. So with uh, with MetaMask, I usually just use Remix for convenience. Remix is super convenient. So what I would do is I'd take, let's see, let me, you know, let's do something easier. Let's just do guess the number because that's very straightforward. So guess the number. I'll say do it again. It'll deploy. Now it's opened up a MetaMask account and you can't see it because of the fact that I'm actually doing it in a separate window. But what I've done is I've confirmed the MetaMask transaction. And so now it's deploying whatever contract to a particular address. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to point my contract that I make. I'm going to call it guess the yeah. So I'm going to point my contract to the instance that's created on chain whenever it actually gets created. And this is all via testnet. So there we go. Cool. So once it deploys, I'll be able to point to that address. And the way I do that is I say, Oh, no, it's Injected Web 3 instead. So Injected Web 3, I have access to my account. The transaction was confirmed as I got a notification. I will copy this address, and I'm going to point my contract to that address. And I'll have to first compile this. So I'm going to hit Auto Compile just so that it doesn't need to be changed every single time. So it's compiled my contract. It says, hey, there's an issue because this is an outdated syntax thing. We don't really care because it's not our problem. We just want to be able to point to that address. So we've got the contract, we compiled it. We have the option here to select it. And now we're not gonna deploy it. We're going to say at this address, it has been deployed and we want to interact with it. So all good so far? Yeah. Cool. So is complete gives us false. That's what we expected. We didn't expect it to be complete right off the bat. So we do know that the answer for this is 42. All we need to do is put it in, hit guess. That's strange. Let me make sure it's the right address. Yeah, it's the right address. Oh, I see why it's failing. I forgot to give it one ether. It asks for one ether as a prerequisite in order for me to be able to call the guess function because I didn't call it. It was saying you're going to have a bad time if you try to do that. So now that I've hit that, MetaMask says, that's OK. Go ahead and do it. I hit Confirm. And now we'll wait again for the transaction to complete. And in about 15 seconds to a minute, we'll be able to see whether or not the guess was correct. I mean, we can expect it to be correct because the value is on chain unless they lied to us on this page. And it was actually answer equals 43, which is something they could have done just for fun. <laughs> it would have been kind of mean. but So now we get a complete transaction. It says it was executed successfully. The parameter was 42 that we passed in. And is complete is now true. So we go to check solution. It checks. It asks again for a MetaMask transaction. I hit confirm. Because it needs to change state in the uh, situation that I am correct. Because the checking is actually updating a smart contract that holds all of my points. And so if I did the problem correctly, it'll, it won't give me any points this time because I've already done it but it would give me those points in the case where I had um, not done it before. But that's the way you would interact with it. You'd go to Remix, you'd compile the contract, you'd point the contract to a specific address, and then you can interact with it via the functions that are given to you. And you can also, of course, set the ether via the value, change your account, if you have multiple accounts, and you'll use injected Web3, since that's what MetaMask uses. And it, uses injected web three. Um, JavaScript VM is like a playground. It's all local. You don't actually manipulate anything on chain and a web three provider is using your local host. Yeah. So again, as Simon mentioned, you don't need to actually interact with it. If you'd like to do the challenges and get really good at this, be my guest and go ahead and try it. Uh, it's still checking, which is kind of surprising, but that's the, the general flow. If you were to actually do this, all we're asking is if you were to do this, can you write out what the steps are to do that? So yay, it says I did it, 200 points for getting the answer. Cool, so are there any other questions that anyone has about 
this whole process of how you'd actually do it. And again, oh. try it. it's not something you have to do. Where did you change N again? Sorry, I think I uh, missed it. So N, when you have a contract that's either deployed or you've designated at some address, you'll get this little box here that says, all right, here's the functions you can access. And I changed N by just putting in the parameter right here for guess. Oh, OK, thank you. Of course. And I highly recommend if you have a function with multiple parameters, use this toggle in order to separate the parameters out. Uh, sort of a disclaimer, Remix is kind of weird about some parameters. Like if you have an array of strings, it might get really frustrated. Um, not to say you, you would need this for any of the homework, I mean, or even any of the challenges, rather. Uh, but if you do try to play around with it, it might be weird. So I'd say just hang in there and try to figure it out and search it up. Like the rest of the space, it is very new and kind of buggy. So don't be surprised if that happens, just as a disclaimer, if you choose to do these challenges um, on, in your free time for fun. Cool. Are there any other questions about blockchain security in general or about the homework? Awesome. Well, yeah, I have a go ahead. Uh, if, you, uh, if any, any of our students want to learn more about security and blockchain security, what resources would you recommend? What courses at Berkeley would you recommend to take? Uh, very clever, Simon. <laughs> well, I think that the Blockchain Fundamentals course is actually a great course for security. And I'm not just saying this is a plug. This is something that I learned only recently. There was a lot of stuff I learned in that course that was quite frankly way too much at the time. Like Bitcoin script is something I only use in the context of security. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that's really technical in there that you'll be able to learn a lot about if you're interested in that stuff. But also a disclaimer that if you're not as interested in that in-depth te technical stuff, I would recommend you know going for, there's a lot of resources out there um, and you can consume lectures on your own time as well. Um, definitely, if you want to feel like a Bitcoin or blockchain master, the courses we have at BAB are super helpful. But if you're interested in it from a certain perspective, I would highly recommend, for example, looking at our edX course where you can eat up the, the lecture material piecemeal. Yeah, and if you also are looking for security related stuff in particular, um, Fundamentals of Smart Contract Security, which is the book that I contributed to during my time at Quantstamp, which was the one that um, Simon had mentioned. This is, to my knowledge, one of the only smart contract security books that's out there. Like, I don't really know too many other, like the only smart contract security book that comes up is like this one. So if you guys are interested, uh, it's kind of expensive as paperback. It's like $16 as a Kindle book, but that's honestly a great resource for just getting the initial steps. Um, but one free resource that I will recommend is this one right here. And I'll link it just because it's such a helpful resource. This one, it just gives you a huge feed of smart contract best practices and considerations. And oh, I gave you, let me give you the actual. Yeah. This one just gives a lot of information. If you have the time to consume all of this, you will be a smart contract expert, trust me. So all of these resources are really great. And of course, capture the ether. So, cool. Any other questions? Alrighty. Well, if you ever need to reach me, I will put my email in the chat if you'd like. Always happy to talk about things that are blockchain related or security related or blockchain security related. Or if you have any general questions about CS2, more than happy to help. Cool. If that's it, then. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Nadir. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. And happy you all enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.